We just came to be. I was bought by the stork. <laughs> we all were. <laughs> Please be advised that this episode of Caution includes descriptions and mentions of childhood emotional and sexual trauma, parental control and manipulation, parental disappointment, shame and anger around sex, grooming behavior, childhood sexual abuse, incest, survivors not being witnessed, domestic violence, pornography, harmful body explorations, collective grief, and crushed curiosity. We highly encourage our audience to review our trigger guide for self-care at healtoend.org slash caution. When I was in elementary school, we would go to recess and there was a lot of graffiti on the walls of the school and one piece of graffiti, very big on the wall, said sex. At this point, I already knew, or I figured I knew what sex was. And so I always wanted to have my mother know that I knew about sex. I wanted to talk to her about it. And I was like, how could I get her to talk to me? So I was trying to trick her. So I went home and I asked, I was like, mommy, what does S-E-X stand for? And she's like, what? And I was like, well, I see it on a wall at school all the time. What does that mean? And she was like, nothing. I don't know. And then she walked away. And so I felt really bad because of the way she looked at me and stuff. I said, she knows that I'm trying to trick her. So the next day I said, oh, mommy, I figured out what that meant. It was S-E-X-Y. I didn't see the last letter. So it's sexy. She was like, "Mm mm-hmm. With these disapproving eyes, always letting me know that this is not anything she's going to touch with me. I kept trying because at many points in my youth, I would be sitting down at home watching movies with my entire family, my sister, my brother, my mother, my father. And we would watch some sometimes rated R or even PG-13 movies where there would be cursing or certain references to sex or intimacy or kind of insider jokes that only people that know about sex would know. And they would laugh (laughs) and I'd be like, they can't see me laugh because I'm not supposed to know this thing. I was like, okay, I'm going to try it again. I'm just going to talk to my mom straight out. One day we were in her room talking. I go to my mom and I say, mom, you know, the movies that you watch, I really like those movies. And there are things in there that you all laugh about. And I know, and I just want you to know, I know so I could laugh with you. And this is my kid mind thinking like, this is the way to get in. And she's like, what do you know? And I was like, I know about sex, mom. And then she's like, you do, you know about sex. And she's like, you don't know anything about sex. And I was like, I do. And she's like, who taught you? And I was like, my sister. And she said, she taught you about sex? And I was like, yes. So now I can laugh with everybody. Not soon after that, my mother left the room totally upset. Went and did some talking with my brother or something. My sister was coming out of the shower and going into the room. And my brother pretty much rushed her, like ran towards her with every force in his body to try to catch her. He was pissed and she slammed the door. He literally broke the door off the hinges, ran after her. She still had a towel, had to run out of the house with a towel into the hallway. And it was this anger that he had inside of him. Like, I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill her. There was a big old argument about the baby, the baby, me. I still didn't quite get the connection. Here's another opportunity. I'm trying to bring up this S-E-X. I feel like I'm almost trying to tell my mom. My sister is my abuser for many years when I was young, but there's no conversation there. So it was tight lip, secretive, and very shaming. She would give me these looks like, what are you trying to do? You can't get me to tell you these things. First time I remember asking about sex, I may have been seven or eight. My parents and my brother, who is a few years older than me, they were all sitting around. I was a very curious child. So I put two and two together. It just dawned on me out of nowhere. I was like, huh, so when you want to make flowers, there's pollen that goes from the male to the female. I mean, I had no idea. And the male and the female tigers that have the babies together. I was just thinking out loud, processing out loud the things I had learned about the natural world, kind of in a very organic way came to the question of what, how are human babies made? 
And as soon as I asked that question, oh, the range of reactions. So my mother, of course, she gives the look, the gaze. She's alarmed. And my brother has his guards up. And my father, who's always been the more open and chill person about these things in our family, he starts giggling and (laughs) he almost starts opening his mouth and being like, well... The words haven't even come out of his mouth and my brother gets angry. His anger shuts down the conversation. Fast forward, I am 12 years old. I had this older cousin who I didn't get to see very often, but we had a kind of a special connection. And she tells me one night, did you know husbands and wife can touch each other everywhere? And I ask her, everywhere? And she's like, yeah, everywhere. (laughs) By this time, I believe I had enough education that sperm, egg, and then fertilization, and then baby. I knew that much. I think I even knew that babies popped out of vaginas, but I still didn't know what sex was. In my imagination, I remember after she said that, I was like, oh, so they touch each other's genitals and they get to see each other naked, which was not, in my experience at that point, something that anybody else was allowed to do unless they were a doctor. Fast forward on 15, 16, we have a computer at home. It's a Windows, God knows what year. And those things were, oh my God, I don't know if you remember, just full of spam and junk and viruses. The blessing was that parents did not know how to work these things. So it was just me and my brother who did everything we did to this computer. So one day I'm on there and suddenly I see these virus pop-ups populate this screen. And it is a lot of pornographic images of erect penises going inside vaginas. There were these gifts that would load and they would just show the motion of here is the penis pumping. And that was the moment where it all came together for me. I think I even knew that the penis has the sperm, but I didn't know that the erect penis goes inside the vagina and then goes in and out for a very long time. It just kind of keeps going. If you're lucky. <laughs> but in porn, in porn, it was like, oh my God, this keeps just going. <laughs> Were you able to openly discuss your curiosities and questions around sex growing up in your family? I find it so amazing that sex makes a family, very literally, and yet it is the most taboo subject to try to discuss with a young person. I've spent my whole life trying to understand that sex is every single person's origin story. And our origin stories are so important in forming our identities and in understanding who we are. Yes, we're denied that. We are deprived of that with every force possible. This protection (laughs) that exists to make sure it's delayed for as long as possible from the origin story. Children are told a lot of horrific stories about a lot of things. And nobody thinks just because they hear a story, they're going to go do horrific things. But somehow... The fear of if they know about sex, horrible things will happen. There is this really real barrier of trying to have honest, open conversations about sex and sexuality without feeling like you're a horrible person for opening up those conversations with a child. Are we actually saying, let's talk about sex? Because really, the conversations about sex and sexuality, we could have every single day of our lives until we die and not have to talk about penises. Or vaginas. We can talk about sexuality connection in so many ways, but we limit it to that thing. And that's why it becomes so scary. Also, we cannot forget that there are many people who identify as asexual and aromantic. And when we only think about the act of sex in this heteronormative way, we completely leave out an entire segment of people. And half the time they're lumped in with probably being queer. Something's wrong with them because they don't have relationships. I've never seen them with anybody. And then we often think something's wrong with our children. Because it's either they're doing the thing we don't want them to do, or wait a minute, they're not doing any of it. And there doesn't necessarily have to be anything wrong. Research shows that most children under 13 frequently engage in developmentally appropriate sexual behavior, such as trying to see someone else's genitals or breasts, standing too close to others, or touching their own genitals. Sexual behavior is only considered inappropriate when there is obsession, coercion, or distress. 
think the perception that there isn't much to talk about when it comes to sex and sexuality is so pervasive and so harmful. Because then when you have that mindset, when you talk about, okay, sex education for young children, oh my God, we can't tell them where penis goes because everybody just fucking is thinking about where penis goes. That's all they think sex is. So it's just like, but what age do I tell them? When do I tell them? And the job of sex education, the very first job, I think if you're doing it right, is to break open that very notion. You just need to open yourself up to understanding there is so much to learn. Think about how backwards this is, that we leave alone a parent who does not give any information to their child about sex and bodies, in fact, deprives them of that information or even shames or punishes their child in some way for having access to that information. We are okay with that. A very blatantly neglectful behavior and neglect is a form of abuse. We're morally fine with that. But we go after parents who understand the importance and the vitality of actually giving a child the information that is just necessary, essential for their development. We think that is the bad parent. That is the harmful parent. That's the parent who's going to fuck their kid up. I hope humanity survives climate change long enough so that one day we can look at the current culture of sex and understand how backwards shit is. It keeps going back to this notion that we think sex is inherently exploitative and conversations around sex are inherently harmful and damaging. And so people really struggle because it's not even about what your values are or what your co-parents values are. It's about if your child has this information, how can that reflect on you in the most positive way? It may be really helpful to them, but it will make them stand out among other children. And it can put you in real danger of being either called or being persecuted for having given a child appropriate information about their bodies. In a lot of families, the notion is that hiding the sexual connection of parents from children is the right and moral thing to do. There may be some kissing or hand holding, but otherwise everything is kept very private. It's the trope of a child walking on their parents having sex being traumatizing is played over and over and over. And I always ask myself, what are you doing that you think is traumatizing for a child to even stumble upon it? I'm suggesting actually approaching this subject from the beginning as if it is something that if a child is exposed to in any way, even casually, it is not even harmful to them. If you're having good sex that you're enjoying and it's connective and you like having it, I don't see why this is something that the knowledge of or the accidental viewing of may be so horrible for a child or a teenager or whoever. And that's a larger conversation that we should probably open up as a society. Why do we think this is so harmful? Why do we think this is so damaging to a child? A parent who is driving a car and their kid is with them from the time they're three months old to the time that they're 16 years old, sitting next to their parent, seeing how they drive. And then just imagine one day the parent says, here, here's the key, sit there. You've been watching me drive for 15 years, so you should be able to do it. Be safe. I trust you. What the fuck is that? It seems ludicrous. No one would do that because we know that there is a handbook. There are rules and regulations. There are boundaries that need to be adhered to so that you can be safe in order to drive. They need to know things about cars, how to change a tire, what happens if the windshield wiper break, like all the things, all of the safety things you wouldn't even imagine. But when you think about sex, we actually do that. Not talking to you about anything or very minimal. When you fall in love, you'll know. Sex will be right and you will know it. It'll happen naturally or whatever the hell. Be off a little birdie. Now have a beautiful, sustainable relationship and have good sex. How does that happen? It can't. Even though that child could be watching two parents in a loving relationship for 50 years, that's still not going to say anything to them. All they can do is admire and hope to have that connection with somebody and wonder how they got there because they don't even talk about it because it's all in the realm of romance, love at first sight. When I saw your mother, I knew. 
I knew right then and there, which those stories are beautiful. We can talk about our emotions and feelings, but then after the emotions and feelings are talked about, what went into that? What went into cultivating that relationship, which we don't talk about, the work. We fight in secret. We talk about family problems in secret from the family, the mother and father, and it continues with that isolation of topics. What should the children know? What should they not know? How do we protect them? In a 2004 survey of American teens, nine out of 10 teens said it would be easier to delay sexual activity and prevent unwanted pregnancy if they were able to have more open, honest conversations with their parents on these topics. What I learned about sex throughout the years was a combination of what I could pick up from different psychology books about sexuality. You know, these old ass psychology books that now I think about some of the information they provided. I was like, oh my God, it's terribly wrong. <laughs> that information. You know, what's interesting, one of the things I remember from reading those books was that it had these statistics that three-fourths of girls are non-consensually sexually touched by the time they get to 18. When I was a teenager, so I was trying to make sense because I kind of wanted sex. I wanted to know what it was, but I did not have any concrete understanding of what that was. So part of me was eroticizing. Oh, that maybe I'll be one of those three fourths <laughs> who gets like sexually touched. <laughs> And then part of me was absolutely horrified. So it's true. It's fear that I have that my body can just be fucking violated at any time. It's completely true. In one word, I want to describe my entire childhood and sexuality is fear and eroticism mixed together. One inseparable entity is my entire childhood sexuality. But I remember knowing about rape first, knowing about violence, then learning about reproduction then learning about sex, and then learning about orgasms and masturbation. The order is way out of whack. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I didn't know anything about orgasms either. I just thought it felt really good when you touched yourself. And the first time that I actually had it, I actually didn't know what was happening. I didn't know if it was a religious experience or something, because I felt like I elevated off the bed. <laughs> and I was like, what is that? Whatever that was, I want it again. And I knew that I couldn't talk to anybody about it. Oftentimes when we have something that's fun and exciting, we want to share. That is why a lot of kids play together because it's playful and they don't see it like this horrible thing. But we know very early on that if you do share, you got to be really careful and it has to be secret. It's like, God damn, we start that secrecy shit right at the beginning especially when it comes to sex. Something that's very present for me is the violence embedded in not having information. Knowing that sex was not about me and my body and my emotions and my feelings primarily. It was about literally everything else and everybody else. From mm -hmm. my family to society to religion to laws to legality to everything else. That is violence to me. Why did I learn that? How did I learn that? How would have my life been different if I learned the truth that the primary thing that matters is my feelings and my values and my boundaries and me getting to actually form that before I even think about sex and sexuality. But because everything was backwards, it all started from fear, shame of sex and sexuality and my body. And then me trying to cope with that, I was very much like... There is sometimes nothing else to do except for disconnecting from my body through obsessive masturbation. And I would use substances and tools that were clearly not good for my body. I did harm myself. It was all experimentation and exploration without information. So I am not shocked now. I am glad that I survived that era. <laughs> <laughs> without too much long-term damage. And I just tried to imagine how would have been different if I just had access to a single book with correct information that put things in the correct order for me. Yeah. It would have been night and day, my experiences growing up. Same here. I think about this all the time. What could have been different? I think everything could have been different from the moment my sister started grooming me, I would have known. I would have trusted my instincts. I would have felt comfortable to speak 
and say to my mother, or even to say directly to her and say, no, this is not cool. It would have changed all of the ways in which I made relationships, the way I see my body, the way I treat my body. The stupidest thing I ever did in experimentation was take a popsicle and put it in my vagina so that I could make my vagina taste better. Uh, I had the worst yeast infection of my life. <laughs> Who knew sticking some edible thing inside your vagina would give you a yeast infection? I, I didn't know that. <laughs> In a 2021 study, when adult survivors of CSA were asked about disclosure barriers, they expressed that lack of openness to share details of sexual encounters contributed to their hesitancy to disclose sexual abuse. Also, several survivors highlighted the importance of sexual education from an early age to know what is and is not normal. I think we go through conflating fantasy and reality a lot of time because we don't get to actually flex that muscle of fantasy. I had a lot of fantasies when I was, I, I still do. I have a big fantasy brain, but I didn't have anyone to talk to about these fantasies. I would try this thing that I was fantasizing about and then it felt horrible. And I wondered why, because you see these things and it all looks good. And in my head, it was perfect. It was like a story. And then here you realize it's completely different for so many reasons. It's a big realization. What is the difference between fantasy and reality? What do we tap into? What do we leave behind? How do we get to a place where that's even comfortable? Because most of us get to that comfortable place at way later on in our lives because we don't have the language. I was 12 years old and there were these boys that were visiting from Puerto Rico and all the girls were like, oh my God. There was one guy named Johnny and he was so hot, beautiful. Oh my goodness. He was 18 and I was hanging out with him with a group of people and he said he liked me. And of course I was like, oh my God, this guy likes me. And he was like, you want to meet me in the staircase? Of course, that's where everybody went to go kiss. So we did that a couple of times. Then one night he said to me, meet me in the hallway tonight. We're going to fuck. It did something to me. It made my heart drop and I had such terror in my body and excitement. That day I went home, I was pacing in my room trying to figure out what to do. And I was just so afraid. I didn't go outside for like two weeks. And I said to my cousin to tell him that my mother found out about us and that I had to break up with him. And it was a lie. It was very scary. It was the first time anybody had approached me in that kind of direct thing. The fantasy in me was like, this older boy, oh, love and kisses, and he's holding me, and then we're gonna do this thing. And I was like, oh, bursting the fantasy bubble of something so innocent for me, but really I'm fucking 12 and he's 18. How romantical. I swear to God, I wasn't even wearing a training bra. That's how young I was. I think a lot of us as young people, this conflation, the sex and the love together, because we live in the fantasy and we don't get to the reality part until after a lot of experiences. Holistic sex education, beyond comprehensive sex education, sex education built on a real functioning, healthy relationship. That is the opposite of grooming. We keep seeing over and over so much proof that says information about sex is life-saving, literally. It saves lives. If you knew that holistic sex education could save a child's life, even one child's life, wouldn't you want to do it? That takes the work of forgetting, throwing away all the bullshit that this system has told us about sex and intimacy and creating that for ourselves. When I was able to realize the power of sex education in transforming lives, not only just saving lives, but transforming lives, how miserable people can be because of lack of sex education and how powerful it can be in transforming that. That is the thing that keeps me going. If you don't have any conversations with your child about bodies and sex, I would even say if you are holding on to shame around your own body and your own sexuality and are not comfortable with that, children know that already and they're just not going to come forward and engage with you. It's heartbreaking because I understand so many parents, we're all surviving, we're all trying to figure out how to be comfortable in our own bodies and children are part of that process, but they pick up on that. So not even just opening up and being able to build that relationship and that comfort around on talking about bodies and sexuality, but it's doing that personal work and being honest with children about how you're not exactly where you want to be. And that sometimes they may pick up on things. And that's because you're a human who've had your own complicated upbringing. Education 
is not just information. It's not just verbal giving of information to someone. You can do education in so many different ways. And especially in nonverbal ways, what we're talking about here is modeling, having good sexuality, healthy sexuality and relationships for a child can do so much more than pinning down a child and trying to bombard them with information about their bodies and sex and all that. People question survivors all the time about why they didn't come forward sooner, why they didn't report what happened, why they didn't tell someone who could have helped. And for every survivor, that answer is different. For many, it's the fear of not being believed. For others, it's the shame they absorbed from having brought this on themselves, which is a big part of what kept me from speaking up sooner. But the single greatest factor that prevented me from saying anything was that I had no idea that what happened to me was actually rape. Something that made me realize around me touching my own body, even though it took me a long time to figure it out, that when I touched my own body, it felt really different than when my sister did. It felt really good. But definitely there was confusion because there's obviously a connection because she showed me these things. And now here I am doing these things. So lots of confusion, but something very clear. What happens here feels weird or wrong in my gut. And then here, I love it. And I want to be by myself doing it. It was like my own agency, my own bodily autonomy. But if I would have had that conversation with my mom about what is SEX or getting deeper about what do you mean? What does sex mean? Tell me what is sex? You tell me and having a conversation right there, that probably would have been the day of disclosure. That probably could have been a healing day, but that fucking fear, Lord, it just overrides everything. We talk about CSA discovery, disclosure, and how parents feel entitled to getting a lot of types of information from their children. And it's a very naive form of entitlement. The conversation a lot of times gets stuck around the child got to let someone know. The goal is to get the child to let someone know as soon as there are signs of grooming or CSA or right after. And that's wonderful. But I feel like a lot of the times the child is trusting the harm doer. And that's why you don't get to know because they're trusting the harm doer. So really, we're not talking about why are they trusting the harm doer and what needs to happen for them to have a better sense of who they can trust and who they shouldn't be able to trust what would a process of showing your family and your children look like if you are showing how trust is built how intuition is built Mm -hmm. how negotiation happens how questioning authority happens in a particular way your children should have the right to question you because what a fucking wonderful gift to have in the world to know that this is an authority but i have the right to question that and have a dialogue about something. That is the most beautiful gift you can give a child, their voice, their agency. And that's the thing that we skip. We go right to the fear, right to the thing, penis and vagina, and what the outcomes of that are. Pregnancy, HIV, STIs, reputation, unwanted pregnancies. We think about all the bad stuff, bad stuff, and not think about the actual nuts and bolts that keep the thing that we call relationships, love, intimacy together, sustainable, intentional. People are so focused on grooming behaviors or grooming material, focused on the groomer side. And we don't ask, why are our children so prone to being groomed? This isn't about victim blaming. No. Again, we're talking about a trend, a pattern here. We're not talking about instances of abuse where a stranger is attacking a child kidnapping them, taking them away, where physical power is taken away. That's a different scenario from the majority of cases of CSA in which there is no explicit physical violence involved. The grooming only works because a child's relational dynamics have not been developed. And of course, it depends what age child we're talking about. But if a child is old enough to be around people who are not close adults to them, and the relational dynamics are already in a way that they are willing to trust harmful behavior, why is that? Or even in the many cases when a family member is a harm doer, I have a hard time imagining a family in which a child from the very beginning is able to have a secure attachment and a good relationship with 
someone in the family unit being at risk of being sexually harmed in an ongoing way by another family member. And that's what prevention really means, is building that foundation. So if something happens, you have a foundation to work with, to build upon. So if you're starting to build your foundation after disclosure discovery, then you can still get there. It's still good, never too late, but don't expect quick results. Don't expect somebody who didn't have the kind of language or the kind of way of talking about their experiences and their emotions, how are they going to suddenly know how to talk about something that is so difficult? I keep thinking about my own experiences of sexual violence and how there's different types of heaviness and hurt and pain. There's a pain that my body was violated. There's a pain that I didn't do more. There is personal pain. There's pain around how I showed up and how my body was targeted, all of that. But there is a different kind of pain, and that is about how I'm going to be seen by mm-hmm. others. Yes. As someone who was the target of sexual violence and someone whose body was violated. And that's the pain that I've been trying in my work to take out of conversations around sexual violence because there's already so much to deal with. It hurts me every time to think about the extra pain of now worrying about how does society look at you because society's view of sex and sexualities and bodies, the integrity of a body before and after sexual violence and how that's different. How can we take that out? How can we not put that on anybody, especially CSA survivors, especially children, because they know what's really difficult about coming out and talking about it to your parents is because you know you have a feeling about how they think and feel about sex. And they think now that sex and you have happened, that you are different and they look at you differently and everybody looks at you differently. And that pain is just so icky and unbearable. Nobody fucking needs that in a different world where we were building our connections and having more connections with our neighbors, our family, cousins, aunts, uncles, school systems, churches, whatever it is, if we had intentional connection with our community, then when something like this happens, it wouldn't incite gossip. It would actually be more of a time and a space where we're doing more educational work in the community. We're sharing information, storytelling, and doing healing work together. That This happened in our community, and now we're coming together as a community to heal because it happened to that person, but it's a ripple effect, and we're going to get more information and be stronger as a community and thinking about how we handle this. Then it's not gossip. It's actually still talking about the thing, but in a very helpful way, and it's not in that secretive state. And I think gossip is the secretive state of needing to talk about things more publicly. And this is not to say we don't have privacy. We should have our privacy, but we don't live in that vacuum. We have that And we have to have the connection in order for these things to function properly, to get proper information. We actually do need to talk about this vulnerable things that happen in our community. We have to talk about what happens to Black boys and girls. We have to talk about what happens to disabled children. And so if we had a different orbit of connection, then it would be a different processing of information and not seen as negative talk that doesn't do anything for anybody. One of the powerful things when death happens is if you are lucky to be held in community, something that's really important is that when you lose a loved one, other people come forward and they share with you their pain and their empathy. They tell you if they have lost a loved one, how it felt for them, how they survived it, how they dealt with it. And you cry with them. They cry for you and they cry for themselves. And it's just having that openness suddenly around grief, being able to grieve with your community. That is the huge difference in when you lose a loved one and it doesn't become traumatic. You go through a healthy process of grief. What if we had the same thing happen around sexual violence? Mm -hmm. Instead of making it be this really giant, untouchable, private topic that you cannot talk about, you cannot share around. I'm imagining coming out and saying something about my experience of sexual violence, disclosing to those around me, and then people coming forward and telling me they've had other experiences of sexual violence. Here's how they felt. Here's how they responded to cry with me, to hold my feelings, to grieve with me. And I think that's appropriate even for a child. You're just saying that makes me emotional because this is what I struggle with today, witnessing, fuck. 
can somebody please witness me? We say the power of storytelling, people sharing their stories and their emotions and their feelings. You're absolutely right. When somebody passes, when a tragic accident happens, people do share those emotions and they're like, thank you for sharing that. That makes me feel seen and heard and held and that I'm not weird or something is wrong with me. God, that's fucking medicine. Imagine if thinking of a child, and I'm talking age appropriately, an adult saying, that happened to me. I'm so happy that you did speak up and I know how I felt. That's powerful. It's collective, collective healing, collective grieving. Yeah, and it completely undoes the very powerful thing about violence that becomes trauma. Again, violence doesn't have to become trauma. Violence happens. It doesn't have to be trauma. And the thing about it is once you know you're not alone in the experience, once you know this is actually common, it's bad that it's common, but it's common. That's how we relate to death. We understand death as it happens to all of us. It's just part of life. Now, sexual violence doesn't have to be part of life. I hope one day it is so rare that when it happens, people are shocked and it's like, what? But we don't live in that reality. We live in a reality where just about every single person can understand what sexual violence feels like, either from personal experience or experiences of loved ones. And yet we keep acting like this thing is just in a silo and it's by itself. And we keep being traumatized around sexual violence because we don't get the support that we need in time. We don't get the empathy that we need, the witnessing that we need in time. We keep thinking we're the fucking only one who had to suffer this. Yeah. And it's like this collective lie we perpetuate and we participate in upholding. Like the word come, I learned that from that virus porn. Uh, yeah, because virus it, porn. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh, already. 